the power of design thinking and its role in creating stability, for agility, for change and for growth. So design thinking is being mass produced. It's heralded as the magic pill for innovation and transformation. But from my experience, humans, we don't like change. We like certainty. But life is messy, ambiguous and emergent. The role of design thinking is not just about process tools and techniques. Whilst your technical expertise will certainly help for real change, growth and resilience, we need to look at our soft skills, our human skills. So what's been happening? Well, I think we can all agree the world has radically changed. And we've been talking about change and the rate of change since the 70s. And whilst there has been debate over this rate of change over the past 50 years, it is fair to say that we're all feeling it now thanks to COVID-19, and it is now evenly distributed across the globe. This pace has increased out of necessity, and for good reasons, to save jobs and to save lives. To save jobs, this means some of us need to reimagine our businesses, whilst others need to reinvent themselves. In both cases, we need to be relevant to our employees, to our customers, and to society in order to recover and evolve. So what's the solution? Well, I believe it's design thinking. And design thinking has been around for a long time. In fact, there's an ISO standard that started in the 90s and evolved to this diagram you see here. I admit it's not the most attractive diagram. It was designed by ergonomists and engineers after all. But who am I to say such things? Well, actually, this is where my journey began in the 90s. I was that ergonomist following this approach for things like designing air candid check-in counters uh, and even working on an amazing project to redesign the New York Stock Exchange trading floor. In the 2000s, I shifted from physical into digital design. And more recently, I've been working with organizations transform their culture to be more human-centric, as well as looking at the future of education. So over my past 25 years, I've seen this philosophy evolve and change, and change for the better. The design thinking double diamond, as you see here, this is the one we happen to use at Foolproof, has come from a wealth of professional disciplines and expertise in ergonomics, engineering, psychology, design, software development, and even business management. This is what I believe Bill Burnett, the executive director of the design program at Stanford, meant when he talked about radical collaboration. And it's by no coincidence that he teaches design across the engineering and the arts departments. If you look at the number of design thinking training courses on offer, we are clearly not the only ones who recognize its value. However, after talking to colleagues and peers, as well as my own experience, I find that most design thinking training will teach you the importance of things like doing research and listening to your users and critique and creativity and adaptability, but they don't necessarily teach you the how. The soft skills around empathy, creativity, resilience, and transformation are not only important for designers, but they're also seen as critical by the big players in technology and business to help us navigate COVID and uncertainty. The thing is, these skills have been needed long before COVID. And as I can see, many people in our industry still seem to struggle with change, ambiguity, and empathy. So in preparing for this talk, I spoke to a number of my colleagues at Foolproof and asked for their critique. I'd like to thank Zeke Raffitt, Rachel Tan, Jai Lu, Rob Hall, and Zoe Girondon for their help. It was Zoe, an excellent speaker, designer, and friend, who reminded me of one important thing, trust. The role of trust in learning and developing these soft skills. The need for physical and emotional safety. Now, trust is a whole talk in and of itself, and it's not something I'm going to be able to cover today. Instead, I want to look at the how. But Zoe also reminded me of Simon Sinek's book, The Infinite Game. And in this book, he defines finite games. So these are games that have known players, fixed rules, agreed upon objectives. It's clear who wins and who loses. And there's a finish line. As an athlete, I sympathize for those gravitating towards the predictability of the finite game. It's easier when we work with people like us, who know what to do, who don't question us, with a clear project plan that, at times, we blindly follow, and fixed deliverables. But life and work is not like that. It's the infinite game, where the players change, the rules change, and deliverables evolve. So we know the importance of resilience, 
adaptability and transformation, and empathy. What I'd like to do is start to think about the how. So for resilience, how do you build stability? For transformation, how do we experiment with velocity? And for empathy, let's consider how we create social and self-awareness. So let's start with resilience. How do you create stability so that you can respond to external forces with purpose and intent? And when thinking about this, I began thinking about my early formal education in sports science. We are always taught to widen your stance and lower your center of gravity for greater stability. As an ice hockey player, I've made that mistake of standing tall with my feet too close together. Any nudge from another player and I'd fall flat on my rear end. It hurts. I very quickly learned to widen my stance. That way, if I was nudged by another player, I was able to resist and stay on my feet. However, sometimes that force coming towards you might be much bigger than you. So I happen to play hockey in a mixed league and some of the men, quite frankly, are as big as fridges. In this case, resisting is not the best option. However, with that wider stance, I am also able to pivot and change direction more easily. So from a physiological point of view, this makes sense. A wider stance lets me react with intent, be it to resist or change direction with purpose. But how do you apply this from a cognitive or emotional point of view? So I also thought we should look at sports psychology and sports science. So I wanted to look at the comfort zone theory, which is also often um, coupled with the yerkes dodson arousal theory. And what it states is each person has a comfort zone. If you stay inside that zone, you do not learn and grow, you remain static. You need to step outside to grow. The arousal theory states that there's some optimal level of stimulus needed for optimal performance. So in both cases, if you step too far out or there's too much stimulus, for example, anxiety, stress, fear, or the opposite side, you have too little, you're bored, you're inattentive, this will result in lower performance. Whilst both theories have been debated, and there was something with the yerkes dobson theory around mazes and mice and electrical shocks, and clearly we can't apply that to humans. They do, however, provide a useful framework when considering the conditions you need to perform at your best and in your context. So as an athlete, designer, and manager, they have helped me to consider how far to push myself outside of my comfort zone without freezing or choking, but equally reminding myself um, that I, need, I can't um, remain static so I need to push myself enough so I don't become complacent. These zones or inverted U's will change in shape depending on the situation we're in, the role we're playing, and as we grow and develop. So to apply this thinking to projects, I like to use this tool and it's called, I just named it, what do I bring to the project? And to set up this tool, we begin by taking a job or a piece of work or project and bringing it down into the collective skills, knowledge, and experience we need. So we're very fortunate to work on a really meaningful piece of work with the National Museum of Singapore and we were looking at helping them design spaces for people living with dementia and we unpacked the skills and knowledge needed for this project as you can see here on the slide. We asked everyone on the team so we, we conducted two-week strategy workshops and we asked everyone on the team to complete it. It was clear that no one person on the team had all the skills and knowledge However, when we combined the range or base of everyone on the team, we quickly saw that our collective base or range was much bigger. And then we can see if there are any gaps. So if there are too many gaps, your team can become unstable and you lose that ability to be agile and adapt. However, introducing say one or two new pieces of stimulus can help you build that adrenaline or alertness that you need to learn something new, to see what's emerging and respond with purpose. If I may, I'd like to share a story about my colleague Valerie, who actually led this piece of work. Now Valerie shared with me that she was anxious about this project. She had not led a strategy piece like this before and she felt way outside of her comfort zone. But I reminded her that she had a solid base. She had the skills to facilitate, to coach, the uncanny ability to sense what's emerging, clarity of purpose, and a tried and tested approach. It was not easy for Val, and to quote her, she said, it was a very painful experience. Whether she knew it or not, despite her fear and imposter syndrome, she had a strong foundation, and with a pinch of courage, she led this project wonderfully. The outcome of this experience was positive. 
the National Museum of Singapore have reusable design assets to build a range of experiences for people living with dementia. The museum, dementia community and sponsor who worked on these sprints with us, learned the power of, um, of radical collaboration and design sprints. And Val realized that she has the right mindset and passion for UX strategy. So stepping outside of your comfort zone is a muscle and one you must keep working. If you feel some nervousness, that's okay. It just means that it's working. And building this range will also help you experiment and transform, which is my second point. So management consultancies have been raving about the power of design thinking in business information and transformation. But as designers, this is nothing new to us. We have been transforming human experiences for years. And more recently, we've had to transform our own methodologies to keep pace with ambitious product life cycles and shrinking time to market. So for example, we've seen the Lean Movement, Lightning Decision Jams, and Google Design Sprints. I'm not gonna explain these here, but if you're not familiar with them, I do recommend you step outside of your comfort zone and give these tools a try. At the core of these tools is experimentation and velocity. It's important to note that velocity has both speed and direction or speed and purpose. So when we look at our double diamond in design thinking, in the first diamond, we're focused on understanding the problems. We're trying to find the purpose. It's about doing the right thing. There's no point making something that no one will ever use. Now experimentation helps us speed up that process and identify the best direction forward. But experimentation comes with a level of expected failure. We humans do not like failure and often we're afraid of making mistakes. Despite being born with curiosity and using play to learn, somehow this is conditioned out of us. So there's a fundamental shift we all need to make. We need to see failure as a form of learning. Now rationally, I think we all understand this, but it's a lot harder to fail in front of your peers. And to do that, we also need emotional safety. Wait a minute, I said I wasn't gonna talk about trust, but actually what I am talking about is trust. And I think if you look at old school sort of traditional um, leaders and even some businesses and even some MBAs, they seem to shy away from this. They want the finite game, transactional relationships, clear winners and losers. But organizations are made up of human beings. We want connections and relationships. We yearn for acceptance. What I'm trying to say, I guess, is really that transformation experimentation, to do that, we really need trust. We need to trust in the process, we need to trust in each other, and we need to trust in ourselves. Back in 2017, I spoke at UX India, and this is where I shared the double diamond roller coaster. This is the emotional roller coaster we all go through as individuals and project teams. We start with this clarity of ideas, we have moments of genius, this is great, I know what I'm doing. We prototype, we test, and as we start testing with users, some new information emerges and you start to realize this isn't going to work. Oh no, I have to throw it away. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm an imposter. Oh, but wait, I've got clarity again. I'm a genius. And off we go again on that roller coaster. So life is a journey. Trust your journey. Embrace failure and embrace the emotional roller coaster. Learn and grow and see how far you can tra transform. So I've shared how to create range for resilience and the need to build trust for experimentation. The third skill is empathy. And actually empathy is really important because it can help you build trust. Empathy begins with social and self-awareness. So self-awareness is made up of internal self-awareness. So how clearly you see your own values, emotions, and aspirations, and the impact these may have on others. And external self-awareness is how accurately you perceive how others view you. And social awareness is the ability to take the perspective of and empathize with others from diverse backgrounds and cultures and to understand the social and ethical norms of behavior. So to help our clients better understand their users, so their social awareness, we use a framework called Jobs to be Done. So the theory behind Jobs to be Done is focused on the premise of designing better human outcomes rather than seeing the product and service as the outcome. So this is aligned to Simon Sinek's view of the infinite game. In order to construct jobs to be done, we listen, we observe, and study real people. 
what they say, what they don't say, what they do, and their context and their environment. So when you think about the needs, you need to broaden your range and think about functional needs, emotional needs, behavioral needs, as well as motivations and desires. But in order to understand others' social awareness, we also need to understand ourselves' self-awareness. So this means being aware of our own emotions and behaviors and how that may impact the information we gather. So I'm not a psychologist or a life coach, but there are two things that I've been playing with recently that have helped me do just that. And I call them, what am I bringing to the meeting and who am I bringing to the meeting? So what am I bringing to the meeting? This is very technical. All you need is your thumb and a way to see the entire team on the screen, or luckily if you're in person. So I set this scene to, by sharing with the team that we're going to share what we bring to this meeting. And we all bring things to meetings. They're neither right nor wrong. They just are. I then ask people to show their thumbs. I'm doing well, however you want to define well. I'm neutral or I'm not doing well. And I give the team a chance to share only if they wish. Um, as a leader in, in this meeting, for example, I always kick it off and I try to be as open and honest as transparent as I can, as this helps to build trust and safety. In this case, I was doing well due to caffeine. I had two cups of coffee and um, we had just won an exciting uh, pitch of work, actually with my colleague Aga, who you can see also has her thumb up. Saying this openly and specifically in this meeting reminded me to slow down and take a deep breath particularly as most of us in the room were neutral and someone was actually not doing well. So I know my energy can be really useful, a good source of motivation and inspiration, but it also can be a distraction to our conversations and therefore I may not get in the information I need, I may miss something. So being aware of my own energy and the energy of the group enables me to regulate as needed. The second exercise uh, I like to do is who am I bringing to the meeting? And this is based on a psychological theory called transactional analysis. It was developed by Eric Byrne in the 1960s. So it helps us explain why we think, act, and feel the way we do. It's fairly straightforward, which is why I like it. So it states we have three ego states. The parent state, the adult state, and the child state. And we all unconsciously activate these st ego states in conversations with others and ourselves. And we may change across that conversation. So our parent and child ego states are based on past experiences. In the parent state, we may mimic the attitude and behaviors of our parents. In the child state, we often feel and behave as we did as children. The adult ego state, ego state is based in the present. It's our ability to think and act based on what is actually being said in that moment. So for example, an adult would normally ask questions in a meeting to understand or to deepen their understanding whereas a critical parent might ask a question to prove their point, often to be right, like the infinite game. When someone initiates a conversation, they'll begin with one of these states, and it may impact how the other person responds. So when you think about the double diamond and our design thinking, when we're in that divergent discovery phase, actually a curious child state is helpful. However, when we move into that divergent defined phase, the adult state is pr probably more helpful. So let me share a situation to see this action in theory. So someone I managed came up to me and said, I'm not able to affect change because no one listens to me. I'm not able to affect change was said quite matter of factly and felt like the adult state. However, no one listens to me started to sound like the difficult child. And I did my best to respond in the adult state by questioning to understand. So I said, why do you think that is? He shared with me that he needed a promotion, that a senior job title would make people listen to him and do as they are told. Hmm. This was still in the difficult child state. And the conversation continued in this way until slowly and quite miraculously it broke down as I moved into the critical parent and I could hear myself saying, you need to be more open. What language did you use? And that's when I realized I needed to be more adult. It would have been far more helpful if I had some, said something like, so how will this job title help you? What other options are there? When you embark on the double diamond emotional roller coaster, consider what and who you are bringing to a conversation. This awareness could help you see what otherwise you could not. It will help you improve your conversations, your insights, 
and the human outcomes you want to get. So design thinking will help you and your business maneuver in this weird and wonderful world. It provides the philosophy, tools, and techniques to help you sense what's emerging, adapt, and transform. Warning, technical skills alone will not be enough. You need to do the work. For resilience, build your range, build your stability. To adapt and transform, create trust so that you can experiment with velocity. For empathy, create social and self-awareness and enjoy your journey. Thank you.